epistles. Hebrews Overview, Part 1. God intended for his entire word to be read, studied, and believed. Yet the source of much confusion among many sincere and devout Bible-believing Christians has arisen for two primary reasons. Number one, a faulty view of the unique nature of several New Testament epistles, especially Hebrews and James. Number two, a misinterpretation, misapplication of the difficult passages within these two epistles. This interpretive confusion has historically led some theologians to call for the removal of these epistles from the canon of Scripture. Footnote number one. For instance, in the earliest edition of Martin Luther's preface to the New Testament, he wrote that the book of James was a right straw epistle and unsuccessfully sought to have it removed from the canon of Scripture. Luther no longer included this statement in later editions, maybe as a result of a change in his thinking. While Bible-believing Christians are certainly not guilty of that type of extremism, we should never be guilty of artificially relegating the truths found therein to future people, circumstances, and times. Be assured, neither extreme is accurate or spiritually beneficial. We should consider and accept the futuristic application of certain passages while allowing the vast majority of these epistles to apply to God's people today. Footnote number two. Examples of future application in Hebrews would include the references to the new covenant, Hebrews 8, 7 through 11, with a covenant to be realized after those days, Hebrews 10, 16 and 17. To illustrate the need for balance, purity and integrity in Bible study and interpretation, Picture truth as a paved road with ditches on either side of the road. Certainly it is important to drive on the pavement, and it does not matter into which ditch one veers. On either side of the truth, error is still error. Those in one ditch view the books of Hebrews and James to be valid, but treat them as inapplicable to believers today. Yet everyone needs to hear all the counsel of God, Acts 20:27. 20, those in the other ditch claim the epistles to be invalid altogether because of the Jewish tendencies of the writings. As it is in many other situations, the truth is found somewhere in the middle. We cannot and should not deny the Jewish flavor of the epistles in question, but neither should we teach that these epistles cannot and do not apply in many ways to believers today, as well as believers historically and futuristically. Understandably, these epistles have a different sense since they are not directly addressed to Christian churches like Romans or the Corinthians epistles. Those of us who teach dispensationalism should never be guilty of creating a system to do our thinking for us. We cannot merely plug passages into their designated spots without considering that the actual scriptural admonition of rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, is a present and ongoing commandment. At the same time, we must not fall into the trap of simply reacting to hard or difficult to understand or seemingly non-Pauline sounding passages in any of the Hebrew epistles by consigning the epistles to a different period. Unfortunately, this is a trap man falls into simply because the designated audience of these epistles differs and their content displays a distinctly Hebrew vantage point. We must approach these books contextually combined with an open heart and mind. Every perceptive Bible student accepts application for the complications found in the difficult passages within the primary Pauline epistles without assigning them to another dispensation. So why not devote the same effort to other difficult passages rather than relegating their entire contents as simply not for us during this age? While it is scriptural and appropriate to deal with the differences, we should not disregard scripture's proper application through private interpretation. Why the haste to assign them to future generations, thus negating the historical, literal, and doctrinal truths penned to literal individuals or people groups of the past? Why assign them to the future if these epistles were also intended to bear many practical and doctrinal truths for us today? We cannot afford to approach these books with any type of systematized teaching that places the Bible into a box. It just does not fit. While this study will not explore all the specifics of the Jewish epistles, we will delve into some of the most pertinent explanations and reasons as to why these letters communicate their message with a different tone and emphasis. In fact, 
demonstrating their underlying purpose and origin not only clarifies their peculiar nature, but also proves the enduring value that these epistles have within the canon of Scripture. Some dispensationalists insist that the books of Hebrews through Jude are solely Jewish epistles, with little to no value for the present church age. Others have categorized these epistles as the general epistles when some of them were obviously not general in their intended audience as they were written to individuals. Both statements bear elements of truth but fall far short of conveying reality. Specifically, while the strong Jewish flavor of these epistles is undeniable, we cannot and should not discount their usefulness for today. With these truths in mind, we consider the obvious Jewish nature of the two most unique epistles in this group, Hebrews, in these first chapters, and James in the chapters that follow. The Epistle to the Hebrews. For some, the title alone, the Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews, sufficiently settles the identity of God's primary intended audience. Yet others might require additional convincing. The internal evidence corresponding to the title serves as such confirmation to any student approaching the Scripture with a right spirit. The entire Old Testament is written to Hebrews, yet Christians rightfully benefit from the eternal truths found therein. The truths found in Psalm 119 would be one pertinent example. God did not lead the writer of Hebrews to indicate the primary intended audience in his opening lines. However, elsewhere in the epistle, God indicated its focus. For instance, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 starts off with God, who spake in time past unto the fathers, hath spoken unto us. This clue serves its purpose, yet chapters 2, 10, and 11 offer the necessary information to fully pinpoint the book's recipients. All these passages considered together indicate why Hebrews has been frequently referred to as one of the Jewish epistles. The writer of Hebrews testifies that the intended audience became companions of those who were accustomed to reproaches and afflictions, that is, companions with the Gentiles. Hebrews 10.32, But call to remembrance the former days in which ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Verse 33, Partly whilst ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. Furthermore, the writer refers to the elders and follows with a sort of who's who of Jewish heritage in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, 2, for instance, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Newly converted Gentiles, unfamiliar with the rich Jewish heritage, would certainly find the record of Hebrews chapter 11 much less beneficial than their Jewish counterparts, especially in the first century. Who wrote Hebrews? Footnote number 3. The contents of the Greek manuscripts are categorized into five groups, and we go through these contents in the footnote in the book. Another point of ongoing contention and dispute concerns the human authorship of Hebrews. Although authorship identity is understandably controversial to some, the human author was most definitely the Apostle Paul. Not only does the title of the epistle suggest such, but this seems most plausible considering that, among other things, the writer exhibited profound knowledge of Jewish history. Others likely had some of this knowledge, but Paul's level of understanding was confirmed by Paul in his testimony concerning his education and upbringing. Acts 22.3 I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, the city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamal, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. Here are some other factors pointing to a Pauline authorship. Hebrews has a postscript. All other books in the New Testament followed by a postscript came from the Apostle Paul, written to the Hebrews from Italy by Timothy. Footnote 4. Like most of Paul's epistles, Paul spoke the words, another man penned them. See Romans 16.22. The exception of this rule is Paul's epistle to Galatians, Galatians 6.11. Hebrews was written from Italy, the location from which the Apostle Paul authored several of his epistles after Acts chapter 28. Hebrews 13.24. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy salute you. 
Paul stated he was the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11:13. But this unique calling to the Gentiles did not prevent his interactions or dismiss his responsibilities concerning his brethren according to the flesh, the Hebrews. In fact, from the very beginning, the Lord called Paul a chosen vessel to bear his name before the children of Israel, Acts 9:15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, that is Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Attributing authorship to Paul early in his ministry contradicts Scripture, since Paul wrote he had not yet traveled to Italy, but had planned on doing so, Romans 1.13 and Romans 15.22. That was fulfilled in Acts chapter 28. Hebrews was written by someone who was a companion to Timothy, matching Paul's relationship with brother Timothy. There exists no scriptural indication that more than one individual named Timothy was ever addressed in scripture. When the Bible referred to the many different women named Mary, the writers distinguished in scripture one Mary from another. This also holds true concerning the many men named James, yet no such distinction is made for the one Timothy mentioned by Paul, whether in Hebrews or in 2 Corinthians. In fact, in both cases, Timothy is mentioned anticipating a certain familiarity with him. Hebrews 13.22 Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. 2 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in Achaia. Hebrews was written by someone who, like Paul, had been or was in bonds. Hebrews 10.34 For he had compassion on me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Colossians 4.3 with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us the door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Hebrews was written by someone enjoying a good conscience. This relates to Paul's expressed testimony in the book of Acts. Hebrews thirteen eighteen, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. Acts 23, 1, and Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. There are several other factors that suggest a Pauline authorship of Hebrews. Except for the Apostle Paul, all the writers of New Testament Scripture experienced a first-hand personal relationship with the Lord during his earthly ministry. Like Paul's testimony, Hebrews was written by someone with a second-hand account of the Lord's earthly ministry, with the truths being confirmed, by those who directly heard the Lord. Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? The writer indicated that the Lord's words were confirmed to him by those who had personally heard the Lord speak, the apostles. Although Paul received his revelation of Jesus Christ directly from the Lord, Galatians 1.12, the Bible twice records Paul receiving confirmation of his message by the apostles in Galatians 2.2 and in Acts 15.2-11 at the Jerusalem Council. Furthermore, the writer believed those words he heard and included himself with those who believed, Hebrews 4.3, to the saving of the soul, Hebrews 10.39. Concerning the authorship further, Hebrews was written by one who had things to say but could not say them because the truths were hard to be uttered, Hebrews 5.11. Although this expression was not limited to Paul, it certainly matched his practice, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. Additionally, Hebrews was written by one who sought to be restored to his audience the sooner, Hebrews 13, 19. Those familiar with Scripture know the ongoing battle Paul faced concerning his desire to minister to his kinsmen according to the flesh, the Jews, Romans 9, 1 and 3, and Romans 10, 1. If this evidence were not sufficient, we could appeal to the testimony of Simon Peter. God used Peter to confirm both the Pauline authorship and the Jewish audience. Peter's epistles were penned to Jews who, as strangers, were scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, 
1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. His audience would have been familiar with the prophets, 1 Peter 1.10, 1, and had received vain conversation by tradition from their fathers, 1 Peter 1.18. This audience surpassed their fathers in that they were a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, 1 Peter 2.9, and were called to have their conversation honest among the Gentiles, 1 Peter 2.12. In Peter's second epistle, written to the same audience as his first epistle, 2 Peter 3.1, he spoke of a letter from Paul to this same Jewish audience. In this letter, Peter confirmed, as Paul stated in Hebrews, that there were some hard truths expressed that would cause some to rest the scriptures under their own destruction. Peter was not saying that the things written by Paul were hard for Peter to understand, but for those who were unlearned or unstable in the scriptures. 2 Peter 3.15 An account of the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, under their own destruction. Paul in the book of Hebrews admitted that some of the things that needed to be said were hard to be uttered. Hebrews 5.11 Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. All these factors do not indisputably prove Pauline authorship, but they certainly pinpoint him as the most likely candidate with nobody coming in at a close second. The Jewish Emphasis in Hebrews At the time of the writing of the New Testament, the nation of Israel certainly continued to exhibit their pride concerning their historical roots. In fact, both John the Baptist, Luke 3, 8, and the Lord Jesus Christ, John 8, 38 through 45, addressed the fallacy of such pride. Paul likewise testified to the zeal that the Jews maintained toward their ancestral roots, Acts 21, 20, Acts 22, 3. Although the Jews failed to obey the law of God and failed to follow the faith of their father Abraham, they claimed reverence to both the law and to Abraham. Understandably, the Jews were often best reached, or at least constructive attempts were made by appeals to their historical roots, Acts 13, 14 through 23. Stephen's message, although ultimately rejected, offers another prime example of this practice, Acts 7, 2 through 53. This pattern became the foundation of the epistle to the Hebrews, incorporating this history by emphasizing, one, Moses, Hebrews chapter 3, two, Abraham, Hebrews chapter 7, three, the Levitical priesthood, Hebrews chapter 7, four, the tabernacle, Hebrews chapters 8 and 9, five, the sacrifices, Hebrews chapter 10, and six, Mount Sinai, Hebrews chapter 12. Each of these elements appealed to the Jews, yet the author of Hebrews also sought to convince his audience that Christ was superior to all in every way. For instance, Christ was superior to the angels, Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, superior to Moses, Hebrews chapter 3, and superior to the Levitical priesthood, Hebrews chapters 5 and 7 through 10. These figures were held in the highest regard by the Jews and Jewish believers who cherished the Old Testament law. The book of Hebrews is in the same genre as Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, which was certainly an appeal to the Jewish nation to repent and turn to their Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul and most of the early disciples, Peter and John included, had a strong desire to see their Jewish kinsmen turn to their Messiah, but were all also looking for the imminent return of Christ. The epistles directly addressing the Hebrews were attempting to appeal to the Jews from their unique vantage point while crossing over from one dispensation to the next. Understandably, Gentile believers lacked this Jewish heritage and needed no convincing concerning Christ's superiority to the law and all else. Neither did Gentile saints need convincing that Christ was superior to Moses, the sacrifice, the tabernacle, Mount Sinai, etc. In fact, the Gentiles were shunned, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, Ephesians 2.12. Understandably, the Gentiles found the inclusiveness of the gospel of Christ quite appealing, Acts 13, 42-49. Without a definite, God-given purpose, it would be inconceivable for the book of Hebrews to magnify or focus attention upon distinctions between 
Jew and Gentile eliminated for those in Christ Jesus. This is especially true when one considers that Paul repeatedly highlighted the elimination of such distinctions in his other epistles. Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. What purpose would the book of Hebrews serve by reintroducing the distinctions abolished in Paul's other epistles? The answer to this question is likely twofold. Number one, reaching the unbelieving Jews, and number two, teaching the believing Jews concerning their newfound faith in the Messiah. This focus of the book of Hebrews has left many Bible students confounded, but context always brings the necessary illumination. Footnote number five. The unconverted Jews still considered the distinctions between Jew and Gentile critically important. These Jewish unbelievers would not even consider the church the body of Christ in their thinking or in their theology. The unconverted Jew had no interest in the Gentile being saved unless the Gentile became a Jew by circumcision, Acts 15.1 and verse 24, Galatians 2.12. This epistle includes an appeal to the unconverted Jews who reject the Messiah because the nation has done so. Peter, that is Cephas, James, and John agreed that their ministry was primarily to the Jew, Galatians 2.9. Therefore, the language of this epistle could be used by them to appeal to the head and the heart of the Jews. Paul, too, had a deep desire that the entire nation come to Christ, Romans 10.1. Paul's primary message in his other epistles was to the Gentile and to the church of God, and that is why he constantly pointed out that there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. All are one in Christ. The Jew would reject such a notion until converted. These appeals to the Jews by Paul, Peter, and John would be rejected if anything was said about the Gentile being saved, just as they did when anyone mentioned the Gentiles. Unwarranted Attacks Some Bible teachers who find Hebrews a difficult book have stooped so low as to denigrate the writer of Hebrews by stating that he must have enrolled in theological kindergarten to have expressed the eternal truths contained therein. Wow! This type of smear campaign is unfortunately no longer limited to politics or to the world, but now directed toward the writers of Holy Writ. It is amazing that anyone would think that the writer of Hebrews or any other of God's chosen stewards of his word were required to show off their theological prowess to be accepted by 21st century Bible teachers. Hyperdispensationalism leads to this type of unwarranted attack upon God's word reflected in the low esteem these teachers have placed upon God's word and God's messengers. Unsurprisingly, those who degrade the writer of Hebrews also dismiss Hebrews as an inappropriate book for the body of Christ. They overemphasize its future application to reject much of its present relevance. Bible students understand the child of God's relationship to Jesus Christ, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, Ephesians chapter 5, seated with him in heavenly places, Ephesians chapter 2, complete in him, Colossians chapter 2, as the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the body, Colossians 1.18. Therefore, some Bible teachers fail to appreciate that the writer of Hebrews did not intend confirmation of the truths he wrote, but the recipients of the letter surely needed the exhortations given in the book of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews focuses upon the Jews and not upon the Gentiles because the Jews needed to recognize their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews offered the best argument for Christ's superiority over all things important to the Jews, whether the law, the land, Judaism, the altars, the priests, the covenants, the promises, the sacrifices, angels, Adam, Abel, Moses, Aaron, or Joshua. Yet the hyper-dispensationalist remains oblivious to God's plan and attacks the messenger to discount the intended message. One can almost hear Paul defending himself. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16. There are those who also appeal to so-called church fathers who expressed various opinions concerning the authorship of Hebrews. All Bible believers know that these ancient writers cannot be depended upon since many of these so-called church fathers were influenced through their unsavory connections to Alexandria, Egypt, and North African theology. Yet the nuggets of truth, even the worst of them may have expressed, remain true. Unfortunately, one must wade deep into the muddy waters to pan out those nuggets. 
When one of these early writers got it right concerning Pauline authorship of Hebrews, this detail adds no credibility to any of their expressed heretical views. Other writers may have expressed many important truths, but attributed authorship to some other writer. Interestingly, the unscrupulous Bible teacher attempts to debunk the truth by pointing to an unsavory writer like Pantanaeus, A.D. 150, who believed Paul to have authored Hebrews. This is the commonly used tactic of guilt by association. The truth must be false because this man's writings contain so many other provable errors. No wonder Bible students do not know who to believe or what to believe. Truth is truth, even if it is the devil who stumbled across it. Certainly, none of us has everything figured out. The New Covenant by way of example, consider that the distinctions of Hebrews between Jew and Gentile are clearly emphasized by the restatement of the New Covenant, a covenant clearly focused upon the nation of Israel. The benefits of the New Covenant are clearly Jewish benefits, although some of its blessings are presently enjoyed by and spiritually applied to all believers today, whether Jew or Gentile. Regardless of the indirect benefits to save Gentiles, the writer of Hebrews pointed out that this covenant will, in the future, directly benefit the nation of Israel. Hebrews 8.8, 8, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Contrary to the false teachings of replacement theology, the new covenant points toward a future period when Israel will come into its rightful place of blessing a restored national prominence. This new covenant is prophesied at length several times in the Old Testament, including this instance found in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31:31. 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 34, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, remember their sin no more. The chart on page 214 is titled, A New Covenant. This is the end of chapter 13.